So it is my great pleasure to announce the third invited talk for the AsiaCrypt 2015 conference, and that is the IACR Distinguished Lecturer of Phil Rogaway. Phil, as everyone knows, is a professor at UC Davis, has had an extremely distinguished career in cryptography, written, uh, I don't know, something like 150 papers, many of which are incredibly highly cited, and he's had a great impact on the field, and he's going to give us all a lot of food for thought today, I think, with his lecture on the moral character of cryptographic work. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks to the IACR board for inviting me to give today's talk. Uh, I guess they take a bit of a risk when you invite Phil to give a talk. You have no idea what might come out. So what I'd like to talk about today is something that um, I've been quite obsessing over since the summer of 2013. And that is the, um, the moral character of cryptographic work and the corresponding moral responsibilities of cryptographers and of the cryptographic community as a whole. I'd like to try and set things in context by discussing social responsibility of scientists in general. I think our current conception of the social responsibility of scientists emerged during World War II and its aftermath. And three particular events, I think, were especially formative. Um, the first of these events was the experience of the atomic scientists. After the war, many of these physicists, driven by a sense of culpability for what they had unleashed on the world, became quite politically active. And um, well, events like the, the unveiling of the Russell-Einstein Manifesto, I think, really were a landmark in activism among scientists. Uh, that particular one giving rise to the Pugwash movement and eventually Joseph Rotblatt's Nobel Prize in Nobel's Peace Prize. Um, a second important historical event was the Nuremberg Trials. Uh, immediately after the conclusion of World War II. Remember that these trials began um, with uh, the prosecution of 20 physician researchers for experiments on humans, uh, often quite macabre and routinely fatal. Um, while the defense proffered that the physicians were only doing their jobs, this was pretty much universally rejected as both a legal and moral argument. And, um, uh, and many of the physicians were, in fact, executed. The third historical event occurring during this uh, post-war, Cold War period was the rise of the environmental movement. Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, I think was especially formative. And she painted this picture of man's future dystopia, not by going up in mushroom clouds, but by the kind of slow poisoning of our environment through the overuse of pesticides. I think in the rise of this new thinking, there appeared what one might uh, consider a kind of democratization of responsibility. Scientists and engineers had to be responsible for what they did, because if they didn't feel responsibility, we'd end up with this world of nightmare bombs and gas chambers and human experiments and a dying poisoned world. I think there are three basic tenets of this ethic of responsibility for scientists and engineers. And the first of them is not to use your work to contribute to social harm. The second uh, precept is that you actually should use your work in order to contribute to the social good. It's not enough to do no harm, but you're actually supposed to do good with what you know. And the third precept is that these two imperatives don't stem just from your role as a human being, but actually stem as a consequence of your specific training and professional role. In our case, um, the obligations would stem from our being cryptographers and computer scientists and scientists and technologists more generally, depending on how uh, far outside you go. And I believe that uh, by the 60s and 70s and 80s, this, this notion of 
an ethic of responsibility for scientists and engineers had really become the doctrinal norm. For example, professional codes of conduct like the ACM code of ethics and the IC IEEE code of ethics would embody this ethic of responsibility. The first two imperatives I listed are the first two imperatives of the ACM code of ethics. There was a rise of non-governmental organizations, things like uh, Computer Professionals for Social Responsibility and the EFF. And uh, these organizations were, um, were interested in uh, science being moral. And I think you could include among these organizations the IACR itself. Our, um, our founding purpose not only speaks of advancing uh, research um, in cryptography and, um, and promoting the interest of the IACR members, but also serving the public welfare. This is also an important part of our mission. And in this light, I think the, um, um, the figure of the, uh, the, the good scientist became a kind of cultural icon. Albert Einstein and Richard Feynman and Carl Sagan and Jonas Salk, these, um, these people were revered not only for their scientific work, but also because they were seen as somehow deeply humanistic in, in their beliefs. And yet, for all that I've said, I don't think that very many scientists and engineers really took this ethic of responsibility to heart. Let me give some examples. Um, throughout the entire Cold War period in the United States, it was never difficult to find the hundreds of thousands of scientists and engineers who were directly engaged in building the, the munition systems that were, that were killing people by the droves. Universities like my own actually have run um, nuclear weapons design labs. For years, the University of California ran all of the United States' um, uh, nuclear web did all of the United States' nuclear weapons design work. When I speak to students, and I've been advising undergraduate students for more than 20 years, I've noticed that a concern for the social obligations of, uh, uh, the, that they may possess or the, um, or the impact that their potential employer asserts is never a consideration in how they decide on employment. Almost invariably, it's a question of, of I, what I will get out of this job, and not what I will somehow contribute to the world as a result of my work. In a kind of odd turn, I think in academia, it's now become uh, a common notion that having a normative vision is actually something inappropriate. Um, uh, Stanley Fish, a well-known literary critic, uh, professor and dean, advises professors to stay far, to keep their ethics far away from, uh, from their academic work. Uh, turning a phrase of Marx on its head, he says, our job is not to save the world, but to interpret it. In the last few years, as we've been uh, recruiting faculty members into my department, I always ask them, to speak on the social responsibility of scientists and engineers. Many of them look at me like, you know, a deer caught in the headlights, not quite sure what such a question could even mean. One data mining candidate who came in a couple of years ago um, and whose work seemed to me to be this amalgamation of DOD funded work for socially reprehensible purposes quickly answered that she felt no social responsibility whatsoever. I'm a body without a soul, she said, as though this were somehow an okay thing to say and to be. But I guess none of this would actually matter if, um, well, if, if what we did didn't implicate politics. And perhaps it doesn't. Certainly, there are lots of objects that directly implicate politics. I don't think anyone would claim that objects like these I'm, I'm showing, this is a stingray device that pretends to be a, a cell phone tower and vacuums up 
all of the cell calls in some region. They're used routinely by law enforcement and by others. This is a drone control station so that the United States can, uh, can, can, can kill Arabs from a safe distance. And this here is, um, uh, is a brochure for a product by Hacking Team that uh, touts that they can monitor hundreds of thousands of individuals simultaneously. No one would claim that products like these are apolitical because they're quite ostensibly intended to, um, to increase the power of authority. And yet you might think that cryptography is different. After all, cryptographic work can be quite mathematical. And if you open up the proceedings of, of uh, a conference like the ones today's, it looks about as political as, as category theory or something, right? It, it's not ostensibly political. So part of my mission in today's talk is that I want to show you that stuff like this actually is political, that it does embody um, uh, political sentiment. Maybe I should say that when I speak of politics today, I'm really speaking of who has what power in society. The claim that, um, that uh, cryptography is political well, I think, you know, in, in some ways, this is a claim so obvious that only a cryptographer might fail to see it. But, but that's what we are, so I should, uh, I should justify it. And I think uh, part, of the, um, part of the difficulty is that there are multiple views of what the cryptographer is. To an outsider, well, cryptography is probably that which is depicted by the popular press in movies like, you know, A Beautiful Mind and Sneakers and such. And in these fictional depictions of cryptography, well, cryptographers are the, the brilliant and handsome mathematicians that power wants to have on its side. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to report that we're these uh, heroic figures that uh, almost always figure well in the films. A little crazy, perhaps, but I think that just adds to the luster. And similarly, the crypto hobbyist, um, well, he's probably read um, books like those of David Kahn or James Bamford, which show quite clearly that historically, cryptography is about power. It's an area in which governments spend enor enormous sums of money, and not unwisely, because cryptography determines the outcomes of wars, and cryptography also undergrids um, uh, economic and political maneuverings. But I don't think that uh, uh, any of us would confuse these fictional or historical depictions of cryptography with what we actually do, right? We hack math, hmm? and that doesn't seem um, very political at all. So, so one explanation for why the outsider might see cryptography as political and the insider might see it as not so at all is because of these two uh, archetypes of what the cryptographer is. Is he, some kind of is he some kind of mathematician or some kind of spy? But I don't think this ultimately explains very much. You know, for one thing, cryptography actually used to be more political. Um, uh, here's Whit Diffie speaking at the New Egg trial. Uh, he's talking of, of his wife, and he says, I told her that we were headed into a world where people would have important, intimate, long-term relationships with people they had never met face to face. I was worried about privacy in that world, and that's why I was working on cryptography. And you know, I, 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 I believe, I believe Witt means this, and in his follow-on work and in his work with Martin Hellman, you see this evinced again and again, you know, in their concern for the key length of Des, or in Witt's book with Susan Lando on the politics of wiretapping, or in his introduction of forward secrecy. Even more ostensibly political is basically the entire body of work by David Chom. Um, remember in 1981, he introduced uh, this notion of, of mixed nets in the paper on uh, anonymous, electron anonymous electronic mail. And throughout, uh, throughout David's career, he's spoken of the 
socio-political aspects of cryptography. Here in a CACM article of 1985, Chom writes, the foundation is being laid for a dossier society in which computers could be used to infer individuals' lifestyles, habits, whereabouts, and associations from data collected in ordinary consumer transactions. Uncertainty about whether data will remain secure against abuse by those maintaining or tapping it can have a chilling effect, causing people to alter their observable activities. This seems quite prescient for something written in 1985. One illustration of how our community has avoided the political is seen in looking at what happened to Chom's body of work, particularly that induced by his 1981 paper on untraceable electronic mail, and comparing it with a contemporary piece of work, Goldwasser and Macaulay's classic paper on probabilistic encryption. So both of these papers appear at roughly the same time, and they actually have very similar citation counts. And yet, where they went really differed enormously. You'll recognize the venues on the right here, where the Goldwasser Macaulay papers went, as, as us, right? This is crypto and Eurocrypt and such. And the papers on the left, the papers that were uh, most important citing Chom's work, well, they actually don't go to any coherent community, community at all. They've been kind of scattered into the wind. Now, you could say, well, there's a simple explanation for this phenomena that, um, you know, Goldwasser and Macaulay's work was, was rigorous. It was easy to kind of build a science on top of it. And Chom's work was not particularly rigorous and that there would be, you know, obstacles to creating a scientific theory based on it. I don't think this explanation is valid at all. You know, for, for one thing, um, uh, Chom's work would, in fact, support rigor. And the fact that it wasn't provided from the beginning doesn't really imply much of anything. Diffie and Hellman's paper didn't rigorously define trapdoor permutations, secure encryption, or digital signatures. But nonetheless, it would be th these notions would be very quickly folded into the cryptographic field. Coming at it from another direction, uh, multi-party computation for years and years lacked any sort of rigorous definitions. But it, too, was. Um, was embraced as a truly cryptographic problem. I think the real answer as to why Chom's legacy and Goldwasser and Macaulay's legacy split is much more socio-political. And in particular, the framing of problems within our world, within the, the, the flagship IACR conferences, is invariably scientific and technical. And the framing of the problems that are being addressed in Chom's world is routinely social and political. Okay. And I believe our community is much more um, comfortable with the one framing than the other. Now, there is a community that has long lived at the nexus of cryptography and politics. And that, of course, are the cypherpunks. The cypherpunks emerged in the 1980s, and they believed that a key question of our age was whether the state and corporate interests would eviscerate liberty through electronic surveillance, or if instead the people would rise up and protect themselves through the use of cryptography. It's actually cypherpunks and not cryptographers who have been the strongest advocates for the use of cryptography. For example, here's Eric Hughes writing back in 1993, we must defend our privacy if we expect to have any. We must come together and create systems which allow anonymous transactions to take place. We are defending our privacy with cryptography. And here's a passage from Julian Assange. But we discovered something, a strange property of the physical universe in which we live. The universe believes in encryption. It is easier to encrypt information than it is to decrypt it. We saw that we could use this strange property to create the laws of a new world. And then finally, here's Edward Snowden 
Um, I'm not sure if he's a cypherpunk, but here at least he's perfectly reflecting cypherpunk discourse in which he writes, uh, echoing Jefferson, in words from history, let us speak no more of faith in man, but bind him down from mischief by the chains of cryptography. You know, when I first started to encounter discourse like this, I felt kind of uncomfortable. You know, for one thing, it's not the way cryptographers talk. And for another, it seemed like they were kind of overpromising. That, you know, there were all these obstacles to the real use of cryptography. There was malware and side channels and subversion and flaky hard uh, software and so on. But what I've come to appreciate is that top cypherpunks understand these limitations very well. They actually know a lot more about building systems than I do. And yet, they believe that despite these limitations, cryptography can still be formative in re-architecting the, the politics of our world. And yet, some of this cypherpunk discourse seems to implicitly assume that cryptography is going to favor the weak. And I want to make clear that that's not necessarily true. I'd like to look at a few examples. Let's start off with conventional encryption. So one reason, um, uh, yeah, so you might think that conventional encryption uh, necessarily empowers the, the, the weak, but it very much depends on how the encryption is used, right? The encryption has to be architected into some system. And if this system is, uh, is a, um, a content provider, for example, flowing a film in such a manner that it can only be decrypted by, you know, within a software or hardware boundary that the user has no realistic access to it, then you have not empowered the user or customer here, you've empowered the content provider. And similarly, if you architect a cryptographic system in which um, the NSA has access to escrowed keys, then again, you haven't empowered the individuals, you've empowered authority. So you could just throw up your hands and say, well, even for something like encryption, it all depends on the subsequent architecture. And yet I don't think this is the right view. I think the cryptography, the particular cryptographic problems do have tendencies, and the tendency for encryption, uh, I do believe, is to support the empowering of ordinary people. After all, encryption directly supports freedom of speech. It doesn't require expensive or difficult to, difficult to obtain resources. It's enabled by a thing that's easily shared. An individual can, at least in principle, refuse to use backdoored technology. And even the customary language of encryption um, imagines this world in which ordinary people are afforded the, the privilege of secure communication, right? The Alice's and Bob's of the world are to be so privileged. And coming at it from the other direction, when we do try to use encryption as a way to prop up authority, we encounter lots of architectural problems. Uh, you know, Clipper chip failed quite miserably, and trusted computing didn't fare much better. In the end, I think uh, conventional encryption does support this, uh, does have this tendency to, uh, to support the weak. Let's look at identity-based encryption, IBE. The aim here is to allow a party to use an email address, for example, as a public key. Seems a wonderful convenience. But what is often underemphasized is that this convenience is achieved through a radical change in the trust model. A user's secret key is no longer self-issued. It's issued by a trusted authority. IBE embeds key escrow, right? Indeed, it embeds a particularly strong form of key escrow where the escrowing authority is able to obtain not only all keys presently issued, but all to be issued in the future. And even if you do trust that trusted authority, a state-level adversary now has an extremely attractive target to subvert, right? 
Descriptions of IBE rarely emphasize this change in trust model, and the trusted authority never seems to be called something like that, right? It's usually the PKG or public key generator. This sounds more like an algorithm than an entity. And in papers, even that entity vanishes further into the background because in the formulation, an IBE scheme will be a tuple of algorithms, and the entities that conceptually live behind those algorithms play no role in any formal theory. Finally, let's think about fully homomorphic encryption. In brief, fully homomorphic encryption allows you to outsource your data encrypted under a public key that you own to a service provider who can then compute whatever you ask of it, returning to you the decrypted answer. And it doesn't have any idea what it's computed, but you decrypt and learn it. At a, from a political perspective, this sounds utopian, right? This sounds great. You're, um, you're disempowering the powerful entity and avoiding this kind of Faustian bargain that underlies um, cloud computing. But I would say this analysis is completely specious because it's quite speculative if FHE will ever evolve into something practically useful. And if you want to assess the political leanings of something that is really so speculative, you shouldn't just assume that it'll give rise to the touted applications. You should focus, I think, on what it does to us in the, in the here and now. And then the story looks quite different. Um, I would say that FHE has produced plenty of, of excitement but nothing of positive value to privacy. And in media interviews and talks, leading theorists and program managers talk about the game-changing nature of this mathematics, but nobody seems to emphasize just how speculative it is or emphasize our vanishing privacy or our lousy computer security. And I think this has consequences. You know, it, it misleads the public into where exactly we stand right now. And it shifts financial resources away from areas more likely to have social utility. And it encourages bright young researchers to work in fundamentally impractical directions. And perhaps worst of all, it provides cover to the strongest opponents of privacy, namely intelligence agencies, who can say how they are working hard to create a more secure world while actually nothing threatening is being done uh, towards the, the, the antithetical interests. In the end, I think it helps keep harmless academics harmless. <laughs> of course, none of this matters if mass surveillance isn't really a threat to us, if there's nothing we can really do about it, or if there's nothing we can really do about it. And um, I guess I lived my life kind of implicitly assuming this until that summer of 2013, when somehow all of this stuff really started to capture my attention. And I would read the news stories and the underlying primary documents quite religiously, uh, uh, producing, I think, much more stress than insight. And it was very complicated. A year into the revelations, ProPublica and the ACLU produced this lovely chart of the 54 programs and revelations that they thought were most important to have come out in the prior year. I hope that helps clarify everything that's actually going on. So it doesn't, of course, right? I mean, there's, there's too much here. And when you scratch the surface, you actually still don't know much because the details of these these programs remain quite obscure. And what I finally realized is that this complexity, um, it is itself an, uh, an application of tradecraft. That the combination of extreme complexity and extreme secrecy is, is this really toxic mix that keeps us from, um, from making good progress or even intelligently criticizing what's going on. And I really think we don't understand what's going on, and that that is perhaps the primary um, insight gained by this mountain of Snowden revelations. And when I say we don't understand, I mean it at a quite basic level. You know, I pick up the phone and call me here, 
I have no idea how many copies of this communication are kept or where they're kept. I have no idea what sort of data analytics are being performed on it now or in the future, right? Because this may be maintained and mined years hence. I have no idea what other pieces of information our call will be combined with. And I don't know if this is going to somehow trigger a human analyst at some point, what I say, or a tax audit, or, um, or some Hoover-style dirty tricks. R really, it's a mystery. It's made the telephone a frightful object. I don't have a cell phone. <laughs> I think that there's another problem, and that's that when we think about uh, where we stand, uh, we often fall victim to this extraordinarily effective framing by law enforcement on what the underlying pro problem is. So the law enforcement framing says that privacy is a personal good, that it's about your desire to control the personal information about you, and that security, on the other hand, is this collective good. It's about living in a safe and secure world. And that unfortunately, these two things live in conflict and that we have to find the right balance. And that modern technology has been a boon to one side, to the privacy side, at the expense of the security side. And because of this, bad guys are going to win. And the bad guys, they're very bad. They're terrorists, and they're murderers, and they're money launderers, and they're, um, they're child pornographers. And we now run the risk of going dark, where our world will essentially be like, uh, like locked closets everywhere. It's a, it's a beautifully crafted public relations campaign that works very well with underlying human fears, right? Implicit in this is fear of crime, fear of losing our parents' protection, and even fear of the dark. <laughs> and there's a completely different framing, of course. I'll call this the surveillance studies framing, not doing justice, of course, to the enormous variety of different views within the surveillance studies. But among the commonly heard tenets are that surveillance is an instrument of power. It's an apparatus of control. And that power, in particular, doesn't have to be in your face to be effective, that often the most uh, uh, the most useful forms of power are exercised quite subtly. Also, that while surveillance is nothing new, technological changes have given governments and corporations an unprecedented capacity to monitor everyone. And furthermore, the marginal cost of monitoring just one more person has, has gone to nearly zero. Governmental surveillance is strongly tied to cyber war and to conventional war and that the agencies and individuals in charge of one, at least in the United States, are usually in charge of the other. That law enforcement framing is wrong when it pits privacy as a personal good and not a social good, because privacy routinely is also a social good, and that furthermore it goes wrong in viewing these two things as in conflict when at least as often privacy and security support one another quite well. That mass, um, um, that mass surveillance, in particular, tends to produce people that are kind of conformant, fearful, and ultimately boring. And at a sociological level, it stifles dissent. And finally, that, crypt, uh, that surveillance is something that's going to be very hard to stop because of the confluence of interests here. And that our field, cryptography, offers at least a little bit of help. I'd like to comment that from my reading of the literature, excessive surveillance routinely, perhaps inevitably, becomes political surveillance. I'm including here a copy of the suicide letter famously produced by the FBI trying to encourage Martin Luther King to uh, commit suicide, uh, accompanied by audio tapes of extramarital affairs of his. And, um, and some student activists during the 1960s, US universities were thoroughly infiltrated with informants who reported to their FBI handlers. 
More recently, surveillance has become a tool for assassinations, for imprisoning dissidents, and surveillance combined uh, or as an implicit part of what's sometimes called Miami uh, model policing has become important in ensuring that, um, uh, uh, that protests are a very intimidating thing to go to nowadays. You will be photographed, your cell phones monitored, your car license monitored, and then you'll be put in a cage, tear gassed, and rubber bullets fired at you. And yet, I don't want to suggest that all of these intellectual reasons are, in some sense, what really undergirds our, uh, our, my disdain of, of mass surveillance. Uh, Bruce Schneier, in his typically pithy way, says, animals don't like to be surveilled because it makes them feel like prey, while it makes the surveiller feel like and act like a predator. I think at an instinctual level, we know that constant monitoring is something that is not consistent with the desirable end of the human condition. So what can we actually do about it? Well, I think one useful way of conceptualizing it was provided by Arvind Narayanan's uh, taxonomy of, of I, I guess it's really applied cryptography, where he viewed cryptography as being partitioned into crypto for security and crypto for privacy. Crypto for security is cryptography that benefits commercial interests, that benefits, benefits commerce. It's the kind of cryptography that's in GSM phones or SSL. Um, cryptography for privacy, crypto for privacy, is the kind of crypto that intends to have social or political ends. It's the sort of crypto that's in, uh, that's in Tor or, um, or, uh, or Signal. Narayana suggests that crypto for security has done great, that it actually has worked well to secure our world to an adequate extent that commerce is thriving, whereas crypto for privacy has been really a failure. And I, I, I think he's right about that. I'd like to enhance his taxonomy just a bit, though, by saying that most of what we do isn't really well characterized as crypto for security or crypto for privacy. It's kind of... Um, crypto for crypto. <laughs> and you know, by this I mean that it, uh, it, it advances the, it continues the program um, worked out by cryptographers, but has no obvious, um, uh, it, it, it's not clear that it'll eventually help crypto for security or crypto for privacy. And at some level, I believe that every field eventually becomes a little bit self you know, inward looking, and that some degree of this is actually necessary. But I think in cryptography, if you become excessively inward looking, then, well, this actually starves out an important social need, which in this case is crypto for privacy. I think crypto for crypto has blossomed to such an extent, and we're a very small community, that there's not a whole lot left for crypto for privacy. So I wanted to give you a couple of examples of problems. I'm running later than my notes say I should be running, so I'll, I'll be very brief. This is a problem uh, still very formative that I've been thinking about. And here I'm just trying to give you a few examples of crypto for privacy problems, okay? uh, ones that you, you, you won't have known of because they're new. Um, so here Alice wants to send a message to Bob, um, an email, let's say. but. Uh, uh, Big Brother is watching all of the communications. Okay, so how can you effectively do this? And it's very difficult to do nowadays. In fact, even the, the, um, um, the mix master kind of cypherpunk creations are no longer operational. So here's a suggestion for a high-level architecture. The Alice drops her encrypted mail to this untrusted server, X. That's how she sends a mail to Bob. And when Bob is ready to receive his mail, well, I skipped a step. So the server X just retains what's uh, given to it, of course. When the server is ready to receive his mail, he makes a request to the server based on his secret key. But this doesn't reveal his identity in any way. The server responds with some value S from which 
Bob should be able to recover, his request depended on a value i, should be able to recover the message m if m happened to be the ith message that was addressed to him. And if it's not, he'll recover an indication that there was no such ith message. This is the goal. If you had no concerns for efficiency, it would be possible to solve by providing to B the entire database. One would like to do better than that. And I've been working on a, a practice-oriented provable security treatment for this problem and protocols that hopefully will do better. Here is another problem that I like in kind of crypto for privacy. And um, uh, it attempts to deal with uh, APTs, advanced persistent threats, that might be sitting on your system. It's a nice explanation of the problem that I think I'll, I'll, I'll skip reading from Adi from a panel discussion um, uh, at RSA a couple of years ago. Okay? So we want to create keys that are enormously long so that if an adversary is trying to exfiltrate them, it'll have its work cut out for it. Nonetheless, we want to make sure that these long keys don't make impractical the cryptography that you're basing on them. We need fast operations that deal with long keys. And um, what uh, uh, Bellari, Kane, and myself have, have found is that there's really a fascinating information theoretic problem that underlies this. You have this enormously long key, K, and you let the adversary learn fewer bits about it. A terabyte of key, I let the adversary learn half a terabyte of information, computed in any way it likes, about it. At that point, I point to P, randomly chosen positions on the key, and ask the adversary to predict all of those values. Okay? What's the best the adversary can do? And um, we've been able to analyze this quite precisely. And it, the approximate answer, if the adversary could learn half the keys, is, is this, that uh, it scales inverse exponentially with a strange constant that depends on the fraction of leakage and the binary entropy function. And there's lots more interesting crypto for privacy problems. And I've listed a few of them here that I, I really like, uh, you know, going beyond the, the, um, um, the most obvious examples of Mixnet and Tor and Bitcoin. My first imperative then that I'd like to suggest is that you should really attend to problems social values, at least some of the time, and do this kind of style of anti-surveillance research, that it, this is a good activity for cryptography, and that it won't lead to stuff that's necessarily boring, that, uh, that there's really fascinating problems that have social utility as one of their <coughs> consequences. I'd also like to say that in speaking with cryptographers about why they're working on what they're working on, I often hear answers that are extraordinarily unconvincing. You know that people are doing, are working on the problem they're working on because ultimately they know how to do this kind of work and it gets published and people have done this sort of work before. And you know these are bad reasons to be spending your life on something. So I would encourage you to really be introspective about your problem selection. And introspection takes time. And we seem to have a culture in which there is never enough time. I think it's OK for people to be writing fewer papers. I think as a community, we should be producing a lot fewer papers and trying to produce papers of more relevance and particularly some papers of significant social relevance. Another suggestion I'd like to make is that it's not only what problems you consider, but somehow how you approach them. And I think the approach that Mihir and I have been practicing and advocating for a very long time, what we call practice-oriented provable security, is a promising approach for dealing with anti-surveillance um, technologies. And I won't try and justify that precisely. The, the, the two problems that I just described as, as recent work are both done in this framework. And I'd like to suggest applying practice-oriented provable security, not just to to crypto for security in Arvind's language, but for crypto for privacy. There are a lot of aspects to practice-oriented provable security, and it's a completely different talk to try and explain them. But I think I'd like to mention a little bit on this last one, 
this kind of condemnatory attitude I routinely feel towards non-standard uh, models. There's really been a quite extraordinary disciplinary narrowing of our field. You know, uh, whole areas of inquiry, things like traffic analysis and information hiding and symbolic models and logical models and connections to programming languages and many more areas have been kind of pushed to the margin, not really considered a, a, a core part of cryptography. This is entirely a social construct, right? Uh, um, these things are cryptographic when one thinks about what cryptography is supposed to entail. And I would like to encourage people to be, um, uh, to be open about other models and other ways of looking at problems. Um, Sometimes it, it verges even on silliness, like when people won't use the word proof for a proof in the random oracle model. You know, all proofs in cryptography are proofs with respect to some particular model and definition. And those models and definitions uh, should always be viewed as suspect, not just in that case, but in all cases where we give definitions in cryptography. And we should understand that models um, are very much, uh, and definitions are very much a dialectical inquiry. I like this quote of George Box. He's a famous statistician. He says, all models are useful. All, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay. And in cryptography, I'm afraid it's very hard to ascertain utility, maybe even harder than in statistics, because, um, because the definitional enterprise in cryptography um, kind of sits at the juncture of, of math and aesthetics and philosophy and culture and the artifacts that are eventually produced. And in my view, so situated, dogma is, is disease. I want to talk a little bit about military funding to cryptography. And I apologize that this and the next couple of slides are, uh, are, are very much from a US perspective. It's hard to ascertain the percentage of cryptographic work nowadays which is funded by the military. I can't find any sort of composite numbers, but it certainly seems to be escalating. This chart shows the percentage of papers at crypto um, uh, uh, that acknowledge US funding that include among that US funding DOD funding. And in the period from like 2000 to 2010, it's under 15% on average. And in the period from 2012 to 2015, it's over 65%. Okay, so there's been this huge increase, it seems, in the fraction of papers that are getting or acknowledging DOD funding. And DOD grants tend to be much larger than NSF grants. So my expectation is that most funding in the United States nowadays actually is coming from the military. And I think this is actually inherently corrupting and in ways that people don't want to acknowledge or talk about. A lot of people think that they can take their money from anybody and it won't affect them because they're better than that. And I think this is a very naive view of things. Our sponsors change our values in ways that we don't necessarily see and they also reflect our values. And the values of the military funding agencies, well, they're definitely not my own values. Um, here, DARPA, I think, is the largest DOD source of funding in the United States, almost certainly. And um, here's DARPA's mission. Yeah, th these agencies don't hide their, their purpose. DARPA's mission is to invest in the breakthrough technologies that can create the next generation of US national security capabilities. They also speak often, having been born um, uh, following Sputnik, of avoiding technological surprise and in creating surprise for America's enemies. I would like to suggest that if the institutional values of those that are funding you are fundamentally at odds with your own values, then you probably shouldn't be taking their money. Funding in cryptography, as it is throughout the sciences, is used to redirect it in 
in the directions that power wants. And it would seem that the directions that the NSA likes, and NSA advises all military agencies in the United States at least about cryptographic funding, the direction that the NSA seems to prefer is to have not very useful work, again, to keep harmless cryptographers. Um, I'm sure many of you have seen these quotes from the lovely uh, uh, Eurocrypt 92 trip report that, uh, that was um, uh, released under a Freedom of Information Act inquiry. I'll read one or two. Three of the four last sessions were of no value whatever. And indeed, there was almost nothing at Eurocrypt to interest us. This is good news. <laughs> there were no proposals of crypto systems, no novel cryptanalysis of old designs, even very little on hardware design. I really don't see how things could have been better for our purposes. My own experience with the NSA was that when I, um, uh, when I was to receive my career award back in 1994, the NSA apparently tried to kill it. The NSF program director felt kind of offended by what she viewed as an, this inappropriate request and not only said no, but picked up the phone to tell me. I think we should all strive to be doing work that the NSA would like to kill. My conclusions are to think twice and then maybe one more time about accepting military funding. Make sure it's actually consistent with your values. And more than that, to regard ordinary people as those whose needs you ultimately aim to, to satisfy with your work. Most of us, I think, are trying to satisfy one another. <laughs> Yes, this is kind of the, the paradigm in crypto for crypto. And beyond that, I think we've often internalized that, um, that we'd like to make the world somehow a safer place for electronic commerce or for other commercial interests. These aren't the only values. You know, there's this long tradition in cryptography of, of, of cutesiness. Um, we often spin kind of fanciful tales to explain the cryptographic problems we've imagined. My, my personal favorites usually involve space aliens. Um, and in, in slide presentations, it's routine to, to depict our adversaries like this little fellow, a cute devil with, uh, with horns and maybe a pitchfork and a tail. I've never liked this, but I think after the, the, the Snowden revolution, revelations, it, it really started to vex me in, in a new way. Um, you know, crypto is actually quite hard, hard to understand, at least for me. And I think that when we try to use these kind of cutesy approaches to explaining our results, we don't make it easier to understand. We actually just add this kind of extra layer of obfuscation and we kind of send this implicit message that I'm so smart that I don't have to even think about actual human concerns. My problems are entirely, um, are entirely made up. And it's, it's worse than that, because I think that this cartoon-heavy cryptography kind of reshapes our internal vision of who the adversary is. If we're thinking about our adversary as a cute fellow with a pitchfork, and if we're thinking of our adversary as a $53 billion military intelligence complex, we will see the world in a very different way. And the kind of problems we will come up with, they will be very different problems. So I'd like to suggest that we should stop with the cutesy pictures and we should take our adversaries really quite seriously. And I think we should, in particular, try to figure out what research is going to frustrate adversaries like the NSA and GCHQ, and we should do some of it. I have several more suggestions. You know, many of us are academics, and at least post-tenure, we're supposed to be able to do whatever we damn please. This is not frequently exercised. Um, and in fact, throughout most of the sciences, it seems that it's not, that academic freedom is not maybe even very necessary or important. But here we are in an area 
um, you know, anti-surveillance research, if you want to think of it that way, for which academic freedom, I think, is actually useful. And academic freedom, if not exercised, is going to wither and die. It's already very much in decline. I think we do a social good when we exercise our academic freedom here. You know, I remember reading this paper by Dan Bonet and his students, The Most Dangerous Code in the World. I don't know if, if how many of you have seen it, in which he describes this kind of universe of middleware that, um, uh, that can subvert you know, the verification of cryptographic certificates that most cryptographers and security people assumed to be present. And I remember feeling this sense that, that there existed this big piece of stuff out there that I didn't even know the existence of that was um, uh, um, really highly relevant to our communications ecosystem as a whole. When the Snowden revelations began to come out and people started to speculate about how they might be um, subverting this or that, it occurred to me that to a large extent power probably doesn't need clever cryptanalysis or even social engineering. They just need to get a good systems level view about what's actually going on in, in, in the real uh, communication architecture and then just break the things that are obviously wrong. I'd like to encourage people, especially young people who are still <coughs> highly plastic, to try to get this systems level view, which I understand is not easy to get but which I'm sure can lead to much more relevant cryptographic work. I think we should be using privacy tools. Very few of us do. Yeah. Um, I think this is an instance of the, 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 the pot calling the kettle black. I never used PGP. I just recently started using Tor and so on. But I think we pay a significant price for not ourselves being users of this kind of privacy enhancing technology. If we were forced to endure the inconvenience of these difficult to use tools, we would be more strongly motivated to try to weave them into the communication infrastructure in a way that uh, dumb folks like us would find it painless. And, um, I'll say that you know the first problem I described, that uh, server-mediated electronic mail problem, I thought about that problem within days of starting to use um, a system called Pond that Adam, Langley, uh, um, that Adam Langley invented. I think a lot of ideas will spring from simply becoming users of this technology. One colleague told me that uh, cryptographers failure to use privacy enhancing tools was to him like discovering your doctor smoked two packs of cigarettes a day and with an intravenous drug user on top of that and so on. I think it's not a bad analogy. A lot of us like to think of the internet as some kind of wonderful cryptographic, uh, as some kind of wonderful commons. Um, it's not really a commons at all. There are specific things on the internet like Wikipedia and Creative Commons and, the, and um, the free software movement, but most of us, most of the time, are using on the internet services provided by a very small number of very powerful companies. I think we should be doing our best to be replicating these services in a more secure way, in a way that's out of reach of power. And there will be important cryptographic problems in trying to achieve this end. Emphasizing that prerequisite, I think we should be trying to create amongst ourselves some kind of, of useful cryptographic commons. Now, the cypherpunks were already advocating this decades ago in their creation of anonymous remailers, for example. That was very much their program. I think we could start small. You know, Wikipedia is a commons that we all employ. Maybe it could become a, um, a routine part of IACR conferences and workshops and doctoral meetings to spend an afternoon or an evening 
gathered around and hacking on Wikipedia pages so that cryptography as, just, as reflected in Wikipedia is really state of the art and beautifully captured. I have a bunch of conclusions to give you. Hmm? And no time. And no time. My, well, I have one minute, <laughs> which I'll overuse. <clears throat> time is a flexible thing. My view is that cryptographers are kind of twice culpable for the surveillance morass in which we find ourselves. First, it's computer scientists that really created this enormous uh, communications infrastructure and then that turned it into this amazing tool for, um, uh, for surveilling us all. And on the other hand, cryptography offers at least some set of tools and hope to turning around this tragic event. I don't think I'm an alarmist with respect to you know, bizarre dystopias that filmmakers and novelists like to put forward. I don't worry about nanotechnology turning our biosphere into gray goo. I never worry about uh, sentient robots coming and deciding that man is a pet at best. But I think here, um, this is a very realistic dystopia. The kind of creeping surveillance that grows organically in the public and private sectors that becomes increasingly comprehensive and entwined and predictive, that becomes an instrument for assassinations and political control and the maintenance of power. This kind of vision doesn't just seem possible, it seems to actually be happening before our eyes, okay, if it's not already here. I'm not terribly optimistic. You know, I think there are tremendous forces aligned to make sure that we don't make much progress in, in these directions. And yet I think there are some, some reasons for, for hope. You know, uh, cryptographic papers inspired by the Snowden revelations are starting to appear apace. There are several people in this room that have been going around giving talks about, you know, post-Snowden cryptography and panel discussions on, on this matter. And I think that we are starting to feel connected to this problems in ways that we didn't prior to 2013. And the cypherpunks are still very much on the stage and creating anti-surveillance technologies. You know, WhatsApp, for example, now has a billion users of it. That's a lot of apparently good cryptography in, uh, in a lot of people's hands. The cypherpunks are sometimes uh, described as doing crypto with an attitude. And I think that makes some of us uncomfortable because it might not quite be our day-to-day -day attitude. But more than anything else, what the cypherpunks have wanted is crypto with values. And I think crypto with values is what we as the cryptographic community are most sorely in need of. And I'll finally end with this. There's this uh, quote, often misattributed to Pericles, that says that just because you don't take an interest in politics doesn't mean that politics won't take an interest in you. And as a cryptographer, you really can ignore the political and moral dimensions of our field, but it won't make them go away. All it'll actually do is to make your own work less relevant and less sociologically connected. My hope is that a bunch of you, especially young people, will recognize this as a starting point in your work and work to develop an ethically driven vision of what you actually want to accomplish with your cryptographic work. Well, I'd like to thank Phil very much for that uh, inspiring uh, call to arms. And I think there'll be some questions, so I'll pass it on to Adi and I'll repeat it. Thanks for a wonderful talk, very thought provoking. Unfortunately, I disagree with much of what you are saying. Uh, I'll take one uh, example only, due to lack of time. And this is your assumption that we can predict what will happen to our new invention in the uh, future. And I'll just give you two examples. Uh, you mentioned that uh, my invention in the mid-80s of uh, identity-based cryptography had an element of key escrow, which is bad. I absolutely agree that uh, it has an element of key escrow. The question is, 
uh, should have uh, refrained from publishing this idea after it occurred to me. And you have to remember that in 2001, it led Bonnet and Franklin to invent uh, pairing-based cryptography uh, as a solution to the problem. And this was used later to uh, uh, do lots of uh, wonderful privacy-enhancing stuff. So while you may criticize the original idea as not going in the political direction you are interested, it was totally impossible to predict what will happen to it in the future. So self-censorship, or your last uh, suggestion that every paper we uh, publish should be tagged initially upon invention as being good or bad in principle, and uh, based on it you should publish or not publish it, is very problematic. My second example, which goes the other direction, is Bitcoin. Bitcoin was invented as a wonderful uh, uh, decentralized system going exactly the way you wanted. On the other hand, if you look at how Bitcoin is practiced today, it's totally uh, centralized. There is a tiny number of uh, large uh, consortium mining uh, Bitcoins. Uh, it's used uh, to do uh, uh, all the ransomware. Uh, I could go on and on about all the bad things that happen. I personally believe it's going to be totally wrong for each one of us to tag his ideas, his research ideas as being born good or born bad, and based on it decide whether to publish or not to publish it. So I, I appreciate that comment and that concern. I've certainly struggled with it much myself. It is very difficult to ascertain the direction of science and technology. And I think that many of us use this as a reason to not pay close attention to where we think things will head. And uh, I am not suggesting that people self-censor their ideas because they think that uh, uh, the political leanings are undesirable. But I think the simple act of keeping strongly in mind where you want things to go will tend as a whole to move us in this direction. Not to each individual piece of work, but somehow as a whole, if our community cares about the social contribution of what we're doing, I think as a whole, we'll move in that direction. Um, uh, and that's the most I can say about it. Uh, I would not uh, minimize the difficulty in trying to be predictive about where our, uh, our most well-meaning ideas might uh, end up or where our uh, most uh, uh, concerning ideas might might evolve. Uh, thanks, Phil, for a very thought-provoking talk. I enjoyed it very much, and I think a lot of us here did. Could I ask you your opinion of um, the Internet of Things and the opportunities for personal privacy in terms of the future of the Internet of Things in 20 years' time, for instance? Certainly. You know, I like this phrase, the internet of creepy things. Um, uh, I think we're continually promised technological advances which are supposed to make life better. And the internet of things is among them. What a wonderful world we will live in when our toaster knows us and our refrigerator can make informed decisions about, um, about our eating habits and so on. I myself have never understood how this vision of a technological future improves man's lot. Um, and yet we seem to head in this kind of direction anyway. I would like to see people be quite skeptical about advances, not only in the direction of you know, Internet of Things, but data mining and a host of, of, of um, technologies that we are closely connected to as computer scientists that I don't really believe are likely to contribute to a more positive future for mankind. So the Internet of Things certainly has with it many kind of security concerns, but it also carries with it the potential of just making life an unpleasant space in which to be living. Okay. Um, so. I think sometimes we do work on stuff that the NSA are not interested in, but they're not interested in it because it's not in their mission. So if I go back to the 92 crypto log, um, it says uh, that he took on some reading material to avoid listening to some talks. 
And this was very good because there was a, a, a three talks which were um, uh, uh, three more snoozers he talks about. And the three more snoozers are, is, is in a session on digital signatures and electronics cash. So I think the point is, is that they didn't actually realise that these would be, that they were ignoring the talks that were actually nothing to do with encryption, which is more to do with the, the, the kind of things that you would want them to talk about. So I think we do work in the areas that the NSA don't want. <laughs> and they ignore us. So um, Amit Sahai told me yesterday that he thought the crypto log article evidenced large blind spots mm -hmm. that the NSA effectively missed. I don't know. You know, at some level, I thought that that, um, that crypto log article pegged our community to a T and that that's what really made us uncomfortable. And yet, I think it is also the case that uh, uh, intelligence agencies, too, have their own very particular way of looking at the universe that does no doubt give them substantial blind spots. Um, my suspicion, for example, is that they really understand nothing of provable security and that that does cause them to make errors that they wouldn't otherwise make. I remember following um, the appearance of, of GCM and OAC, OCB and IAPM, all of these methods for authenticated encryption, the NSA threw in their own contribution for an integrated authenticated encryption, dual something mode, I forget. It took me about an hour, I think, to break it, and I'm a lousy cryptanalyst, okay? Why would NSA representatives produce this proposal, which they proudly said they had been working on for a couple of years to show that they hadn't really been undercut by us academics, that was so flagrantly wrong. Well, it was only flagrantly wrong if you had internalized a definition of what authenticated encryption was supposed to do. And I think the contribution evidenced that these authors, maybe the NSA, were, but at least these authors, really had no definitional understanding of the problem they were attempting to solve, and that they probably pay a price for that. Justin, answers my point that it's impossible to predict the future evolution of uh, various uh, types of research. So we're, we're way over time for our coffee, so I think we'll have one very more quick question and a quick answer, please. OK, a quick question. Uh, I'm under the impression that uh, crypto research today is uh, a, f on a very large part of it <coughs> funded by the government. Maybe not military, but uh, even the university funding often comes from the government, and or it's funded by large companies. So do you think if the research moves in the right direction you talk about, this funding may dry up? It has been a problem across academia that we have relied more and more on government funding. And in the United States, Dwight Eisenhower famously warned that as academic institutions become more and more um, uh, drinking, eating from this trough of academic, uh, of, of, um, of government funding, that they would be corrupted. And you can say the same of, of corporate funding. I think in the ideal world, um, academic institutions would have ample money that was um, really quite um, unencumbered and in the real world we live in, this doesn't seem to be the model at all, and even um, less and less so as time goes on. And I think it's a big concern that all of us academics should be unhappy about. Okay, so I think, I'd, uh, we're, I think I'm gonna go for a 20 minute coffee break, so we'll come back here at 5.35. But I'd like to thank Phil for his uh, inspiring talk, thank you.